Hello, everyone in Indianapolis. My name is Ichi Takigawa from Japan. I'm so sorry that I am unable to participate this session today. My flight was terribly delayed for 10 hours or so. I'm uh, now I'm still in Detroit. It's uh, 3 a.m. I was supposed to arrive here at 2.30 p.m. for transit to Indianapolis, but the actual arrival time was uh, 11.30 p.m. or so, late at night. All connecting flights are already gone. All I got was tonight's hotel and a ticket for tomorrow's last flight to Indianapolis departed here at 11.30 p.m. also. They said uh, that is the only option to go to Indianapolis tomorrow, which I mean I will miss the entire day one of the symposium. So uh, actually, this is my first overseas trip since COVID situations began. Uh, so I was really uh, looking forward to attending the in-person session and uh, would like to talk to you. And it is so sad to miss all great talks on day one. And it is also so sad to recognize that I'm still stuck at somewhere, not my destination, and that I'm talking alone to my laptop PC late at night. Everything was uh, so unexpected, and I appreciate your understanding. Anyway, I'm recording my uh, presentation. I hope uh, some of you enjoyed it. So uh, today I'd like to talk about the applied machine learning for heterogeneous catharsis. And uh, because uh, I am basically a machine learning researcher, not a chemist, so uh, basically I'd like to share uh, a viewpoint from the machine learning side. But uh, this is a joint work with uh, a great chemist in uh, Institute for Catharsis in Hokkaido University, uh, in particular, Professor Kenji Shimizu and uh, Professor uh, Takashi Toyao. And uh, we are working with this problem over seven years, got some several practices and got some uh, lesson learned, uh, which I'd like to share today. And the by heterogeneous catharsis, I mean the gas phase reactions on solid phase catharsis surface. So it's a, a surface reaction involving in many, uh, many uh, factors. And uh, basically it's a notoriously complex processes uh, involving many factors. Uh, and it is very hard to model both theoretically and uh, empirically. In our recent research, uh, we have some results for this target. So platinum-based catharsis for uh, reverse uh, water gas shift uh, reactions. The, we, we have a, a chemical composition up to five elements uh, like here. And uh, as a result, we discovered more than 100 catharsis uh, better than the previously reported best catharsis. We tested the 300 catharsis in total by a 44 cycle of a closed loop system of uh, machine learning prediction and experiment. And uh, obtaining the optimal catharsis, something like this, was uh, hardly predictable by human experts. Uh, this is a chemist opinion. And uh, notably, the uh, niobium was uh, never used in the, any catharsis in the training data sets. And uh, we, we say that this is uh, uh, extrapolative in this sense. But anyway, our method for this discovery is a very standard one. And the one is that uh, we use the tree, uh, tree ensemble, a decision tree ensemble with uncertain quantification. And uh, in particular, we use uh, extra trees regressor and a gradient boosted uh, tree regressor. And uh, with the, some feature representation, which is somehow abstracted or coarse grained uh, and shown, uh, shown here. And basically, the, this is the, uh, chemical composition of several elements to several uh, weight percentage, but the basic green uh, representation is uh, abstracted by some uh, chemical features, something like uh, uh, melting points, electro uh, electronic negativity, or a density, or something like that. And uh, basically, this is in short, so this is uh, we make a very conservative prediction with a very radical input representation. So and the, the goal of today's talk is basically to explain why we uh, go with uh, such a standard method choice. And so the starting up as a starting point, the, at first I had an optimistic, uh, very optimistic about the uh, materials informatics, which is unfamiliar, which was unfamiliar. But uh, 
I have uh, worked in the machine learning for bioinformatics, especially genome informatics, for 10 years. So uh, probably uh, some vague image, something like these three steps. And if, uh, step number one, we give all possible types of available data into machine learning. And the step number two, uh, at some point, machine learning models become uh, smarter than the standard expert. And uh, step number three, we just leave everything to machine learning, and uh, machine learning models suggest more and more uh, promising materials we want. And uh, but uh, today I'd like to uh, share is uh, basically three lessons we learned as as we experience this is uh, illusion and uh, to be shattered. And the uh, first one is that the goal of machine learning and the goal of a chemist are fundamentally different. And what we what we need here was actually not machine learning, but a much but a different problem. Uh, actually, it's a much harder problem we call a machine discovery problem. And the second one is if we go for a hypothesis free and off the shelf solution, uh, as I said before, the exploration by decision tree ensemble will give a very strong baseline, and I will explain why. And the third point is that if we want more than that, more than more than prediction, then we cannot be hypothesis free. So that's the last point. So a little bit abstract uh, topics, but I'd like to uh, share these three points today to you. And, but before going, uh, before I go into the details, uh, briefly, I just uh, as a recap for what. Uh, what I mean by machine learning here. So basically, machine learning converts data into predictions. So let's let's have a, something like a factory line to uh, classify two fruits, orange and apples. And we measure some features, values here, weights and heights of the roots. Then we plot that in here. And uh, the, the number of sample is small than the, it's a big, but uh, if we collect more sample, then we will see some vague uh, rule, like a boundary. And uh, if we uh, can represent this boundary somehow mathematically, then we can get a uh, computer program, something like that. So two values, weight and height, uh, uh, fall, if falls into the, that value into the uh, green region, then we predict it as an apple. And if it's fall into the orange area, then we predict it as an orange. And the uh, important point here is uh, this program generated by the uh, training data can make prediction for a different example than the one shown in the training. So any actually it's, it's it can apply to any any flutes. So if we take here the two two values weight and height as an uh, in the red region, then just this program uh, returned orange as an prediction. And here, then the, this one uh, goes into the green region, then uh, the computer program returns, this is an apple. So this is uh, how uh, machine learning works. So uh, in this sense, the machine learning is uh, basically to, um, the, the way to um, make a program. So it's a way, new way, new lazy way of computer programming. And uh, it's a uh, synthesizer program, so input output function just by giving input output example. And uh, this is a simple setting, but uh, we can apply this simple idea to a uh, various problem. But uh, uh, I want to um, note that, that this does not mean we also understand in the underlying process. So because, uh, for example, here we see the many AI, fancy AI application like object recognition, speech recognition, machine translation, language model, uh, gameplay or something like that. And uh, but uh, we can we can do this. We can do this prediction at the commercial level, as we already know in the I don't know news coverage recently. But uh, we don't we still don't know the, how our brains recognize object or how our brains uh, are utter the speech and the control speech and uh, how we can acquire our, our languages or something like that. So anyway, this simple idea uh, can be applied to various uh, fancy application as we uh, recently observed. So the, <clears throat> this is a very powerful technology if we use it in the right place. 
And um, internal workings of uh, machine learning is uh, basically uh, something like this one. And uh, as a result, we know uh, we noticed uh, machine learning models are not unique even for the uh, same data sets. That's because uh, the, the, there are many machine learning models as there are ways to draw the boundary uh, in the first place. So the, the, how, how it works is basically, as we already know, the, it's a just function fitting to data. So every model just tries to fit a different types of function to given data. So in the red and blue classification, that's a binary classification case, uh, we we assign y equals to one to the training data for the red, and then we assign y equals to zero for a blue data set and fitting function. So and just this function represented a class probability. So how how input is a, like a red class? So and uh, basically. Uh, each model have parameter model parameters, and we just tweak the uh, parameter values to change the uh, shape of a function accordingly. And that's uh, all about machine learning. So this is a quick recap of uh, what are machine learning. Then I uh, we, uh, I would like to go back to the uh, today's topic. So three lessons. Uh, the first one is the goal of uh, uh, machine learning and the goal of uh, uh, chemical science. So uh, basically. Uh, these two goals are fundamental difference. So the chemists basically want to find a material that is better than any existing materials to, today, or a superior material that has never existed before, or something like that. Um, but the machine learning basically uh, algorithm to make a prediction for a given material on the basis of any similarity to the data we have. So it means the existing materials. So this is we see uh, some uh, big uh, conflict between these two view. So when the, from the machine learning side, uh, chemist's goal is uh, basically uh, say it's something like, uh, I want outliers. So I, I want exceptions. So this is uh, the unlikely for some statistical prediction. It's uh, based on the data we have. So and, uh, the setup is fundamentally different from the machine learning. So let's say uh, we put the material space on the x-axis. It's a multi-dimensional. And uh, what we want on the y-axis, for example, materials performance, then uh, we have a training data, like a blue dot here. And uh, basically, the, what, um, uh, what we want, so what chemists want, is uh, basically uh, uh, any material x with a larger y anyway. So Hopefully, it's uh, better than the known best. So, but uh, if we fit the machine learning models, so a machine learning prediction curve, uh, this uh, blue curve cut through the middle of the given training samples. This is a machine learning. So, uh, basically, it means uh, values will fall into the uh, worst value and the best values. And then, uh, yeah, mostly, the, it's, it's unlikely to, uh, to uh, beats the best one because, uh, yeah, that's our machine learning. So uh, this means, in conclusion, machine learning cannot predict better material materials than the, that one in the training data. So uh, this blue curves never cross this uh, red area we want. And uh, basically, first thing I want to mention is that this is not a bag. It's a feature of a machine learning. So there is just a, a conflict between the goal and method. And uh, furthermore, uh, let's try machine learning situations usually implies a, a lack of the data set. So basically in such a situation, it is extremely difficult to uh, model the data set, but also ex extremely difficult to accurately evaluate the, if the machine learning prediction is correct or not, because uh, we need the, another data set as a test data set to evaluate it. So uh, basically, uh, it is a matter, of course, for machine learning to be able to predict a training example. Uh, that's why we need to ensure if the machine learning can predict other examples than the training one, which is a test data set. So but uh, this uh, literally means that everything but the training example, so almost everything. So that's why it's, uh, evaluating this process is a very difficult in practice. So. And the first note is, is uh, uh, the training, the meaning of a training data set and the meaning of a test data set also fundamentally differ because uh, this means that for discovery purpose, so for materials discovery purpose, we need the accurate prediction for the entire input space because uh, 
every point we are interested in. So basically, the, this is a materials uh, discovery setting, and uh, no probability things here. So any any kind of uh, uh, materials uh, we are interested in. So if so, the training data sets also should cover the entire input space. And uh, if we know the uh, design of the experiments in the statistics, then the, we, we also should consider, in the, for example, Fisher's three uh, principles, replication, randomization, or local controllers, whatever. Anyway, th this is the setting of our, our so chemist setting. But the traditional machine learning setup is uh, not like this one. So both of the training data and the test data follow the same probability distribution, which I means that if we has, uh, have some area as out of sample area, basically we ignore it because uh, the probability a new sample falls in that area is a pro very small. So that it's, a, it's a sharp uh, contrast between these two uh, setup. So, uh, so we conclude that we should recognize this problem as a quite different problem from standard machine learning. So just it's not like they're just applying machine learning to uh, this problem or something like that. So it's a more uh, much harder problem than the machine learning. So it's actually not a machine learning. It's a, we call it a machine discovery problem, and uh, which is a, a not the word not I I made. So it's uh, twenty years ago. There is a big a wave of research in this area, and uh, one of the most famous person in this uh, research is uh, uh, Professor Harvard Simon, who won the Nobel Prize in the Turing Award. So double winner over two types of Nobel Prize. So Turing Award is the so-called Nobel Prize for Computer Science. So you know, it's it's very rare, uh, rare professor. Anyway, in Japan, uh, Professor Arikawa released a very big project in this era around uh, uh, late 90, I think. So the, I feel some that we are going back into the you know, revisiting this prob uh, problem. So, but the, we have the tools at the 20 years ago is basically very uh, symbolic. So. I think that now is the best time to uh, revisit this uh, theme with uh, our modern uh, machine learning method and our uh, data sets. So uh, that, that's the first point. And the second point is uh, uh, how we choose, uh, why, we, why we use decision tree ensembles instead of a more fancy, complicated uh, architecture on your network. And, uh, Basically, the first understanding is that we have a two inconvenient mathematical truths. So it's a called curse of dimensionality from the uh, in statistics. And uh, number one, the number of required sample to ensure the accurate prediction for the entire input space, as I said, it's uh, called a, a uniform approximation in approximation theory. But anyway, it's necessarily exponential in the dimension D. Dimension, I mean the number of uh, input features, input descriptors. So let's say there are two, 2D cases. Uh, if we put the five sample for each axis, then we need the uh, 25 samples. But if we uh, 10, 10 variables, so the dimension is 10, that's a uh, five exponential ten, so it's a uh, ten million. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, unpractical. So, so this is our first for our theory, and the second one is a, uh, a probability that a new sample falls into the training set's convex hull. So convex hull is there, uh, some uh, polygon, uh, polygon that covering the uh, all of the training example in high dimension space. And that, that probability is almost zero for high dimensional case. So high dimensional, I mean, the more than the hundred or so. So, which I mean, probably I think people imagine the interpolation is something like this one. So it's a similarity between the existing example, but uh, very interestingly, in this sense, the interpolation almost surely never happens. And learning in high dimension always amounts to extrapolation, which is the, the paper's title by the Jan Lukun's uh, group. And anyways, uh, we know this factor uh, in, uh, in the machine learning theory, so it's very difficult to uh, what we want. So entire, entire input space approximation in the uh, great accuracy. So <clears throat> we need a more safer option. Uh, so that, uh, that is a decision tree ensemble. Uh, so it's a local averaging estimator. 
So, and uh, I'm not sure the how how many people knows the decision tree ensemble, but the, the probably random forest is the most famous one for uh, gradient boosted uh, regression. But anyways, uh, it's a his run rule. So, uh, it's uh, we first uh, partition the uh, input space and then just uh, uh, predict as the average of the samples in that each area. Then we can get the uh, curve, so function. So in this sense, it's a histogram, histogram rule over the data dependent partitions. So uh, it is important to notice that the, an, an, an intentional interpolation uh, never happen in uh, decision tree ensemble. It's uh, basically uh, average over some sample sample. So it's uh, always uh, grounded in some uh, samples in the training data set. So, uh, for out of sample area, even for out of sample area, so if the decision tree uh, prediction is very conservative. And, uh, but uh, we cannot say something confident for that area because we don't have any data sets. So we need some assumption if we, uh, if we say more. So for example, uh, let's say that we have this uh, example and uh, how to interpolate this question mark area, which we don't have any data set. And if we uh, fit the continuous model, like a kernel ridge regression, calves and process regression, or SVM or something, then the, that will be something like this one. But uh, this cannot be not necessarily continuous. Uh, we know the idea of selectivity cliffs and the activity cliffs in the chemoinformatics. And uh, yeah, actually it was, it can be like this one. Uh, so the decision tree was, uh, Decision trees are very conservative in this case, so it's a uh, just uh, interpolation. So at, at least a grounded by the sum sum given data, as I said before. So that's why the, I we think that this is a safer option if we have a lot of our uh, out of sample area in the discovery phase. And also the decision tree class uh, regressor have a very uh, high flexibility or adaptability for non-thermous uh, cases because uh, it does not assume any uh, continuity. So uh, let's see the, so below is the, the one from the decision tree example, like uh, extra trees, random forest, and the uh, light GBM. And uh, it's uh, quite, uh, it's quite non-thermous. And but uh, upper one is a traditional uh, polynomial regression. In this case, if we, uh, if we increase the degree of uh, freedom of the models, then the, we see the very problematic overfitting. But the uh, important thing here is that decision trees are overfit, but it's uh, almost uh, harmless because uh, it's uh, grounded by the data somehow, even in the noisy cases. And that's a second point. And also the if we use the extra trees, it's a kind of a pseudo continuous interpolation for uh, compared with the random forest case, as, as you see here. So that's why uh, we choose uh, this uh, combination. So uh, we, uh, we abstracted the representation in the chemical by only, on the, only we see the chemical feature, but the, we, uh, the prediction is based on the very conservative uh, mechanism. So uh, that's the second point. And the last point is uh, that basically, uh, if we want more than that, so we cannot be hypothesis free. So I assume the machine learning based exploration like ours is basically used and by uh, human ex chemical experts. So I am skept skeptical of so far about whether scientific discovery can be fully automated by AI. So that's because that uh, in the first place, the majority of scientific research is still largely empirical and much is, uh, much is left to lack and inertia. So uh, machine learning based exploration is just a glorified version of our empirical such empirical exploration. It's still a empirical exploration based on the data set. So <clears throat> based on our observation, so and exhibits different types of uh, bounded rationality. It's, uh, famous one from the Harvard Simon, again. But anyway, it's, uh, so it's abound, it's in the different uh, level of ours. And uh, for example, popular book of uh, Professor Julia Paul uh, on the uh, causal inference says that science requires causal understanding. And that's why that we cannot be hypothesis free if we want a causality.
and this is some quotes. But anyway, it's, uh, basically for causal understanding, data is not everything. So we need something else that does not come from the data themselves. So that's a hypothesis models or some flyer or something. And uh, so basically, this is a long discussion in the philosophy of science, I think. That's, and uh, in short, machine learning gave us a prediction, but not give us understanding or not give us directly discovery. So that is uh, our big lesson learned. So um, there is some famous quote about saying the same thing, but uh, basically, uh, if we seek not prediction, but more than prediction, so it's understanding or something, then we basically cannot remain hypothesis free. So because the understanding is our problem, so the problem of uh, human recognition, not the uh, natural science uh, phenomena. So uh, we need to give up the machine learning's versatility. The modern machine learning model have a virtue of being able to represent any function. Probably you may have heard of it. And uh, for example, famous universal approximation theorem says that neural networks, even the two-layer case, can approximate any function just by tweaking the parameter values. And uh, we regard that uh, as a good thing. It's a black box, but it's a hypothesis free. So if we, if we only have a get data, we can make a prediction. We do not need any assumption. And however, so for scientific applications, so this virtue leads to scientifically invalid predictions. Uh, just by a spurious correlation in the given finite data set. And uh, in the most of the experiment, experimental science case, uh, statistically speaking, the, the number of samples is insufficient. So this, uh, this is a very uh, widely uh, seen problem. So it is not good to be able to represent any function. So it is better to restrict the model by design. It cannot represent scientifically invalid function. And that's why the, we see the physics informed machine learning recently. So this might be the first step uh, at, for the path to uh, machine discovery we want. So we somehow relax cellular and stimulation to machine learning, incorporating machine learning inside, or uh, we uh, restrict machine learning to by theory or simulation. And that's a bit of simulation, simulation with prediction or simulation or geometric ML. So there is a bunch of topics uh, along this line in the machine learning community. So that's the third topic. And uh, in summary, so we learned three lessons to share with you. And uh, the slide of this, uh, this PDF is uh, uh, put in this link. So if you interested in the details, please uh, see it. So uh, thank you for your attention.